and we're back like we never left Oregon fans what's going on how we live in thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the ducks dish podcast i'm your host max torres glad to have you along for another episode of the pod cla- podcast happy you are here we are coming to you in a couple of different locations we are live on twitter and youtube uh, at m torres sports on twitter and at Oregon Football Max Torres on Twitter for an Oregon football chat on a Saturday afternoon here in Campbell, California. San Jose, California is where I'm at, but I'm not rolling solo. I got my guy, Ryan Winter, a.k.a. Sports Chat 503. Been way too long, man. How the heck are you? Fan freaking tastic. Love being here, Max. You know the love and admiration I have for you and everything you do for the Ducks. So I'm here, man. Let's do this thing. Yeah, man. Stoked to be here. Stoked to have you back on the channel. Hopefully the, uh, hopefully the audio is cool for you guys out there that are listening. Um, just a quick little disclaimer, you know, do me a favor, you guys, if you want get in the live chat, uh, let, let me know, um, kind of what's on your mind. If you guys have a question that you want to ask Ryan or I, um, definitely feel free to throw it in that live chat and we'll do our best to get to it. Just want to have a good chat, get you guys involved and um, man, get some excitement out there. Cause we had a two week break with no Oregon football and things are ramping up. It's pedal to the metal, Ryan. Once we get uh, into next week, um, April 2nd, Tuesday, I believe is when the ducks will return to the Hatfield Dowling complex for spring practice um, I know one of the things that we were talking about, maybe just getting into to start things off, we don't have a whole lot of information, right? But we do have, uh, at least a little tease that, uh, we are going to get some new uniforms for Oregon, the generation O uniforms coming 2024. Um, let's just talk about some uniform chat. Maybe give me some of your thoughts. I watched a little bit of your video the other day. Um, but the we one could where also- you couldn't hear me, the one where my volume was really low. <laughs> uh, I, I think it came out pretty well, but, um, I know you were giving some thoughts on it. So let's talk some uniforms. Um, uh, maybe we can even get into, um, a little bit of, um, thoughts on last year's unis and kind of what maybe some of your favorites were just to kind of get things going. Yeah. So again, I think people love the uniforms. I do too. I, I mean, I'm a guy who grew up as a, a, a player, uh, you know, uh, who, my first grade year, I remember the first uniform I really got, basketball uniform I got was the uh, gr- Boys and Girls Club with the old school symbol with the two hands locked together. It was a reversible jersey. I didn't take it off for a week. Like, I'm a uniform guy from the jump. Like, I'm an old school Mitchell and Ness guy. You know, old, I love the vintage uniforms. I love everything about what uniforms, jerseys, all that sort of stuff, being a, 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 a uniform guy growing up. Obviously, it's nice that the Ducks have this as their part of their shtick. Um, because you know, it wasn't always like that. You know, it used to be when I, when I was in high school, champion made our uniforms, uh, at U of O and, uh, you know, they had the, just the classic generic, uh, interlocking UO with the, you know, university stripes on the sleeves and, you know, our colors always made us stand out. Right. So the green and yellow is kind of unique. There's not a lot of green and yellow out there in the rest of the country. And, but, but, but the, the scheme of it was very similar to what you'd see anywhere else in the country. And, you know, having that idea of, being innovative and trying to do different things. And, and that, that whole premise that, you know, tradition eats Turkey on Thanksgiving and we don't want to be traditional. And our tradition is to, that we don't have tradition or we, we don't have that whole history of championships. USC always likes to say, this is a zero and not an O right. They tell us how many national championships we have all the time. Uh, it is a, it is a letter, not as not a number, but for those guys. Um, <clears throat> but the ideology is, is that I think it's, part of the fabric of what we're doing now at U of O where there's a lot of innovation happening um, on that side. And I don't think that always was the case. And, you know, when uh, new uniforms get released, you know, I think it kind of brings out the good and the bad, right? It brings out all the people that hate Nike or hate Oregon for their uniforms and all this other sort of stuff. And they think it's just flash and, you know, not, not rooted in substance or anything else. And then I think everybody else looks at it from the reality of, Hey, this is, a Nike test uh, uh, lab basically where they put out the new ideas for how they're going to do the new uniforms, the new 
texture, the new uh, uh, cut, the new, you know, fit, whatever the, how, you know, the tailor, however you want to work the thing out, then brand new uniform Oregon always has the year before the NFL has it, the year before anybody else has it in college football. And I think it's always kind of cool that that's kind of how that works. Now, structurally is one thing, but the actual like look of the uniform is, is, is wild because people want always some futuristic thing, right? Remember when we were kids, it was like, you're in the future, you're going to have flying cars. Well, no, we don't have flying cars, but the ideology is you're, it's still a football uniform. It's got to work as a football uniform. And you, and, and you are, there are some limitations there. You're going to have some certain colorways, certain things, certain structures that you're going to have to be, uh, to fit into. So it was cool when they released that video because what I heard was a couple things stood out. I heard a futuristic look for the new unis. That's uh, that's one thing I definitely heard from Kenny Farr, who is, in my opinion, the GOAT, right? Then I heard multiple retro things. I heard retro th like things as in like multiple options, right? I also heard stuff talking specifically about road uniforms. I think historically, in over the last 10, 15 years, they've really focused on home uniforms for specialty one-offs and really haven't focused on the road uniforms. I think the road uniforms would be a sweet one, especially like this year going to Michigan. Why would you not try to do something a la the Michigan uniform that we wore out there mm -hmm. with Statue of Liberty and right? So, I mean, there's just certain everything is about storytelling. And I have friends that work at Nike. I have a lot of friends that have been there for 20 years now or so, and everything they do is based on the story and the athlete. And I think it's really important to kind of weave those things back to each other because the guys who help build these uniforms, most of them are former athletes, former players. They've woven these things back and forth together to make it a really organic thing. It's not, it's not something that they're buying from Nike. This is a part of the process for Nike that they're using the U of O for their opportunity to do this. And the U of O is benefiting from that relationship with Nike. So it goes both ways. Um, but I love the idea of having a bunch of different people involved with it. You know, historically, they used to always say there was about five to seven guys that kind of made those decisions. This this video looked like there was a bigger room there. It looked like there were more guys in there. They only showed little clips of that video. But of course, I've watched it about a thousand times. And then on the board, it showed basically every single thing you have in the uniform from like armbands to visor to, you know, every single possibility that's on there. And, and it was cool to kind of see, hey, maybe we could put some certain helmets with a variety of different uniforms. And so it's just kind of the, the, the whole kind of organic process of working all these things together, I think, is the cool thing, kind of showing a little bit behind the scenes. So, yes, it was an exciting time. I jumped right on. I did a video. And, I, and then when I did the video, people said they couldn't hear it. My computer, uh, you know, I'm not the most tech savvy guy. I need my executive producer, Darby, to come in here and help me. But long winded answer. I'm fired up about the jerseys and the uniforms, Max. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard not to be because Oregon has been the the trendsetters for a lot of different developments in the uniform uh, scheme. And I think that, you know, to your point, people are like oh, all these uniform combinations and no national championships. I think it's pretty evident that that's not what matters for Dan Lanning, but people can say whatever they want. Um, I think it's very clear that what they're able to accomplish on the field this year is going to be much more important, but like, you're not going to have these Nike connections and not leverage them and not try to do something like absolutely amazing and super cool. That's going to fire people up. Um, I think one of the things for me that I think about with these uniforms and kind of the timing of it all is being able to have new uniforms in year three of the Dan landing era in year one, in the big 10, I feel like it's one of those things where it's like kind of subtly smart, but it's just like another way that I think Oregon's kind of doing all the right things and just trying to really make the most out of this move to the big 10, because I think they're able to step into this move very confident that they're going to be able to be major contenders in the big 10. And I, I don't know if you remember this, um, Ryan, you might be able to help me fill in the gaps here um, a little bit. I don't remember if it was under Willie Taggart or um, Mario when they weren't really playing that well, probably more so Willie Taggart, but he was saying something along the lines of with the uniforms, like you don't, they don't, we're not playing like we deserve new uniforms every week. I don't know if you remember that, um, yeah. but that was a thing. So that's that's far from the case now, I think. Yeah, I, I think there was there was a time when, you know, Oregon had uh, a really solid group of uniforms that they had done um, the, the the Marcus Mariota era. Right. And then you had this 
uh, national championship run and you went with, you know, the wild uniforms for the national championship on both occasions, road unis. And then, um, and then after that, they had all these crazy wild ideas of what to do. Uh, and then the team fell off, right? You, so you had that game where you're dressed like the duck against Colorado and you lose. You have the game where you're dressed like Lewis and Clark, uh, the map uh, of Oregon and whatnot, and you lose to Washington State. You, you dress like Cal and you get drilled by the Huskies in the one of the worst games ever at Autzen Stadium. Is that a coincidence? And, and, yeah, I mean, so it was like people were like, okay, we're done with the uniform. Can we, can, you know, can we just get some wins? Can we... Can we not go for two, uh, you know, against Nebraska or whatever? So there's just it 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 it, it coincided with two kind of things going in opposite directions, right? So then in response to that, they were like, "All right, let's cut this thing. Let's do a couple basic jerseys." They did do the big number. That was remember that was the era where they went to the first the real big number during the Mario Cristobal era, and it was a very stripped down. I wasn't a fan. Yeah. Very stripped down, basic jersey with just a bigger number. And uh, people were kind of like, uh, you know, maybe tired of it. And since then, though, they've done a pretty good job with some of the one-offs. And I think the Ohana jersey, I think, is the best one-off of them all. I, I love the retro jersey just because it's a throwback and it's always fun to see the throwback. But, like, in the creative sense, I think the Ohana jersey knocks it out of the park. I would love to see a white version of that. They talked about a road uh, uh, version. I would love to see a road retro. Um, you know, historically the road retro was the same yellow pants that they wore just the white top. And then in the, the first year that they did the Nike contract, the first Nike, um, jerseys, which is a somewhat of a funny thing. If you want to go down memory lane a little bit here, but the Achilles Smith era is the first year, the 1997, 1998, 1999, right in that era, that first year where they did, um, the, the, the Nike contract, they made the jerseys look like Penn state. They were the most basic, most plain Jane uniforms. Pull up those jerseys if you can on your on your screen. Maybe I don't, you a, I don't have my extra monitor with me because oh, I'm on that's the right, road. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. But it, 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 for the people in the chat, go to those Achilles Smith jerseys. Uh, go to that Washington game, Patrick Johnson with the catch up there, Washington '97. Th that was just a very plain Jane jersey. I don't know if you remember this, but like when Nike got the contract for Penn State, the Penn State people flipped out because they added the swoosh. You know, they were so traditional there. They had never had anything else on their jersey, no other marking. Just the swoosh alone was like complete chaos there. And so Oregon came in with that first Nike contract, that first jersey. And before they had done the O, before they had done any of that sort of stuff, it was the interlocking UO still. And the the um, it was just very plain Jane. And it had the stripe. You know, it was just a very plain Jane. It was just nothing uh, fancy about it. But what they did, though, is their road jerseys they went with the green pants which i thought was dope so uh that that patrick johnson uh he's with with the green pants with the white jersey when he catches that ball in the corner of the end zone. if you don't know memory lane that was a big game for the ducks anyway uh i do think that uh having new jerseys is a shot in the arm and i did think that these jerseys were supposedly supposed to come out last year is what i'd originally heard but then they hit oh. paused on it because of the big 10 shuffle and everything else and they were just make sure everything all their ducks in a row quote unquote and then so they're going to roll it out this next year but i think it'll be fun man i think people the other cool thing i think about the jerseys not only people buying new jerseys and wearing new jersey people who are like those guys who wear the jersey but i think it's also it creates all new gear creates all new color schemes new logos new this sort of that and the other sort of stuff i think that's really cool so market. no doubt no doubt i think um have yeah like i said like with the timing of the big 10 move like Having, I, don't, I still don't think I've seen any Oregon jerseys with that Big Ten patch, but that's just going to be like such a surreal moment. I feel like because um, I've already seen some like USC recruiting photo shoots where they have the Big Ten uh, patch on their jerseys. So very much leaning into 2024 um, in, in a big way. Got a question from one of my buddies, Adam, here in the chat. So shout out to my guy Adam out yeah. there in in the Dale Scottsdale, Arizona. Nice. Um, favorite ducks uniform of all time. Maybe we can hit this one and then we can get into some other stuff in the chat or some other organ what, football. What's your, stuff. what's your favorite max? Um, I think for me, it's really hard to choose just one, but if I had to narrow it down to two, I think my favorite one is, um, I, we first saw it, the retro one, the, the pick ones, um, from 2014, Oregon versus Washington. Um, the year Marcus won his Heisman really, really like those. 
Um, love the UO on the side of the helmet. I'm hoping that's something that comes back this year because um, they've had the O on the back of the helmet, which looks cool, but I, I would like to see it back on the side of the helmet at least a couple times. I feel like that'd be really cool. Or the um, the chrome lids with the forest green uh, jerseys, uh, Rose Bowl, Wisconsin 2012. I think, yeah. um, I think those are probably my, my top two that are, that are hard to beat. Got a lot of underrated ones, but just in that solidified in that top tier, I think I'd put it there. Yeah. If I were to do like a, kind of like a, a home away and a bowl game, I think the bowl game one is obviously the Chrome lid. Uh, I think that's, it's tremendous. And even when they redid it with uh, Herbert, the Herbert year where they had the chrome lid with the little bit of the wing in it. I, I remember if I remember correctly, it was like the green wing with it. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, yeah, dude, no, the, the chrome lids I think was just, that was revolution. That was like outer space sort of stuff. Um, yeah. I think uh, I like, I like the, uh, the, the original jerseys. I think the original jerseys are fine. The, um, when I say original, I'm saying uh, the, the, the eighties, nineties. Um, but the jerseys before that, the uniforms from like Dan Fouts era and the early seventies and late sixties were also right when they first really started to go with the heavy green and yellow were also really cool. You know, like the yellow pants with the green top. And I, I, I always liked that color combination, you know, in a variety, they've had, had in a variety of different ways, different colors, different greens, different yellows, different matchups. But I always liked personally that matchup. Um, I would rather see the two tone than the all green or all yellow. Uh, I like the yellow pants with the green top or the, you know, green top with, uh, you know, yellow top with the green pants. Um, but I do like the, uh, the underrated Jersey for me is the uh, diamond plate. The, the early, um, I saw some people commenting on that in the chat, the diamond it, it was, plate. We're, it, first, the first time we went with the black, first time we went with gray uh the anthracite stuff you know that that was that was a cool era man and the also the first when they went they went from that into the wing the first wing i like i actually have right here in my like i'm looking right at it is jeremiah johnson jersey from the first game where they wore the wings which is the arizona game of like oh oh eight i want to say because the oh nine year was the wing year the, the Rose Bowl year, Masoli. But I, I liked that year because they still had a lot of that like carbon fiber kind of stuff in it, right? Remember all the carbon fiber in the, they, the they had the mm -hmm. carbon fiber in the number and in, in the, the wing pattern was also a carbon fiber. And so I don't know. I think there's, I think there's a lot of uh, great jerseys out there. Uh, but I do think the one-off jersey, that Ohana jersey was awesome to me. And then the bowl jerseys, I think, uh, yeah, the classic is that chrome helmet, man. So Anytime you get the chrome helmet, the, the Ohana jersey helmet though was amazing. It had like all sorts of iridescence and like star pattern or something. Oh, those it, were it, it was amazing. Nuts. It was nuts. I'm so. glad I was still uh still in Eugene at the time when um when they wore those against UCLA. Um, because that was just awesome to to watch. Um and there's god, there's so many good ones, but I, we've I almost also Oh, sorry to cut you. I just saw Rick Olson says they were the camo uni for the spring game. There were some really dope camo ones too. I remember the, the one the that service. had the remember, yeah, the sleeve shirt. Remember the remember the helmet that had the the flying formation type of duck where it had like it was like a couple maybe ducks or it had like a line with it. You know, it was coming this I way. That I, was kind of cool. Yeah, I think I remember what you're talking spring about. Spring game stuff. They did some cool things for about two or three years there. They did some wild out stuff for the spring game that now they just have completely toned back. So. Sorry to cut you off there, my guy. No, you're good. You're good. I was just going to say, I mean, we've almost been on 20 minutes and we're talking uniforms, so maybe we can talk some ball, a little bit of recruiting. Anytime. I Let's know you're you're more into recruiting now than you used to be. I'll, I'll give you, I can't help but take a little bit of credit for that. You should take all um, that credit. <laughs> so we got a question here. I don't know if you heard about it. I talked about it earlier uh, this week on my show. Uh, Timonachi Glass with the question. Thanks for the question, Timonachi. A reminder, you guys drop some questions in the live chat. Timonachi says receiver decommit reasons. Oregon still in it. No new Oregon commits like USC dumpster fires did this week. Why always keeping score? So for you guys that maybe don't follow recruiting super closely, 2025 Pflugerville, Texas Weiss wide receiver Adrian Wilson decommitted from the Ducks. Um, and I mean, the only thing that I'll bring to the table here, I mean, I feel like there's some stuff just in general with recruiting that doesn't always come out. Um, so I'm not trying to put anything sensitive out there, but from what I've been able to gather from the people I've talked to, it's kind of a mutual decision. Um, so 
that's just kind of what it is. Um, but this is going to be, this was his second time decommitting from a school. He was committed to TCU, then he committed to Oregon. And then now he's on the open market, but, um, I wouldn't really expect Oregon to remain involved here. You never know, but this is definitely a national recruit that has just about every offer out there. Um, Oregon now has four commitments in their 2025 recruiting class. Um, and I talked a little bit about how USC went on a, a nice little recruiting run with Lincoln Riley last weekend. Um, so that was obviously pretty important for them flipping a five-star defensive lineman out of the state of Georgia in justice Terry away from the Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, certainly no small feat there. Um, so I think that that, you know, I think Oregon's going to get things going in April. I think that's kind of the easiest way that I would put it. It's been quiet for a long time, but they've brought in a lot of big visitors, stayed working behind the scenes. And I think everything is going to be building up to that spring game at the end of next month, because as we all know, the spring game is Oregon's marquee recruiting event of the year. So that's kind of what's going on with, uh, with recruiting. Um, I mean, with, these high school guys, man, how many girlfriends they have in high school? I mean, come on. Commitment is not necessarily always uh, the, the, the the greatest trait for uh, 15, 16, 17 year old dudes. <laughs> you can flip around a little bit, these, especially these days, man. I, I have no hard feelings at all when these guys, they, they did, I don't even know why they'd want to decide. Stay open the whole time. Just don't commit. If, if you have a, if you want to flip it, do they get something extra by committing? I mean, it's like, I mean, I did, I don't know. I would, I would, I don't know enough about it to speak on it necessarily because I'm not a parent in that situation. And obviously I wasn't an athlete in that situation, but it seems to me that you, your best interest would be to keep it open as long as you can, uh, because you know, the offers are going to come pouring in, especially late. I mean, that's what I would do. Like I've thought about this should be like a whole, um, a whole separate episode one day that I do, or like a live, like how I would navigate a recruitment if I were a five star and like, just like knowing what I know on this side of things and like having been around all of it, um, for as long as I have, I feel like that would be something that's, um, pretty cool. Um, but well, we, you know, we, that, we've talked about it, Max. I mean, like the guys that are the automatics that they're going to have a roster spot for them anywhere, the guys who are pretty much a guarantee. And then the guys that really need to get a spot and need to just take the offer when they can take it. Right. There's multiple different levels of this. Right. And it doesn't matter. It's not five star, four star, three star. It can be a variety of different things based on need, based on whatever the case may be. But some of these guys, the moment the offer gets offered to them, boom, I'm on it. I'm not turning this down. And this might be the best offer I'm going to get. Right. Other guys are like, no, no, I can wait it out because they have the ability to. So yeah, I, everybody's unique. Everybody has a different space at every different team is unique too, right? One guy might be a lock on one team, but maybe not a lock on the other team based on need. No doubt. No doubt. And I think one of the interesting points too, with recruiting is just like, I think a lot of people that follow Oregon football recruiting, they're always wondering why they don't get some of these five-star guys in the boat until later. And it's hard to pinpoint a certain reason. I feel like part of it is logistics and just how, a lot of these guys, it's easier for them to get to some other schools. And I think Oregon just kind of plays the long game. I mean, you look at how they closed last year. Five. Gatlin Bear, five-star. Ryan Pelham, high four-star. Jeremiah McClellan, high four-star. Both those guys flipped from um, you know USC and, and Ohio State. So I think, sure, it'd be fun to, to have some of these five-star guys in the fold early. I know Tony Cumberland's a five-star D lineman out of Scottsdale uh, in the 2026 class, and he's supposed to reclassify to 2025, but isn't necessarily official yet, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, as long as those guys sign on the dotted line and they end up at Oregon, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. I mean, um, yeah. And, and like you said, they're, they're going to, they're going to flip guys. You know, there's always, there's always word around the campfire of who's going to maybe come here. Who's going to come there. Recruits are trying to decide where's the best place for them. And most of it all in my mind always still goes back to playing time. It all, it can't, it can't not be especially now when you have these teams be able to come in and play these freshmen. We're in a new era where these freshmen come in way more, way more prepared than they used to be. And, and teams are willing to play them now earlier. So it's like you, you, you thought it was about playing time 10, 15 years ago. What would it, what's it like now? It's got to be even more. So I, I, I have no, I, I don't fault these guys at all for flipping around and, and, uh, and, and their position coaches might change. Other people's stuff might change. You know, you never know. 
and their families also. Family's got to be in these kids' ears, man. It's got to be really tough for a lot of these kids to navigate just the family, right? I mean, they got Easter weekend right now. You're going to go you're, you're tomorrow. You're going to go uh, do your thing with your family. They're going to do their thing with their family. They're going to have an uncle be like, hey, let me, let me let me holler at you real quick. I think it's USC, <laughs> you know, and then somebody else be like, have you thought about Auburn? Have you thought about the SEC? You know, I mean, everybody's got their own agenda. And these kids are oftentimes, uh, you know, a, 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 a major, major, major opportunity for not only the, the person. Uh, but also the family, right? Not only the player, but also the family. And they want to, they want to hit when the iron is hot, man. They want to strike while the iron's hot. So no problem at all with these kids. Cause especially everybody's floating around these bags. Everybody's talking, everybody, everybody's tampering with everybody. I mean, come on. I mean, when, as soon as they opened up the rules for this stuff, it just went even crazier. <laughs> it was already happening, but now it's just even crazier. Got a comment from my guy, Matt. Kelleher, also in the Dale. Sco Ducks from the pool in Scottsdale. So shout nice. shouts out to Matt. Living. Got to, got to make it out to Scottsdale last month to see my Niners lose in the Super Bowl again. Ooh. But at least I got to do it with some buddies. Question here from NE. Question for you guys. Do you think we see new unis with the Big Ten patch for the spring game? Or do we still see the Pac-12 patch for the spring game? I don't know. I feel like they might be leaning into... 2024 and leaning into the move. Well, I mean, that would be a, a time to come out with something new in the spring game. And how hilarious would that be? Because the Pac-12 is going to be covering the spring game. Pac-12 so yeah, Pac network. Pac-12 network, you would be having the Big Ten patch. <laughs> oh, by the way, our guy who's by the pool, man, cheers to you. I love it. Sitting by the pool, man. I, I didn't catch his name. Mike? Oh, Matt. 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 Yeah, my guy, Matt. What up, Matt? Sitting by the pool. Yeah. I'm a I'm a golf. I'm a ping guy. So ping, we're we're all Scottsdale representatives over there. Let's go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah, I think it'd be pretty insane if um if that is how things <laughs> things went. It'd be a I don't know, it'd be a quite the curtain call on uh Oregon's affiliation with the Pac 12. Um so what a, we'll see what a, happens. What I, mean, a I, know, <laughs> I know you're going to be at that game. I'm going to be in Eugene for that whole yeah. last week of spring ball. i um, going to kick off a Northwest trip, if you will, with Under Armour Seattle. Um, Under Armour next in Seattle. I was at Under Armour Los Angeles last weekend. So, nice. you know, I always want to stay around the the talent, the recruits. Of course. Of course. Um, so you're going to be at the spring game? Yep. Yeah, nice. I'll be at the spring game. I think I'll be in the press box is the plan, but definitely want to say what's up. Um you know, oh, yeah. while you're, if you're out there. Oh yeah. And there's no baseball game this year. So it's just, it's, it's a hangout afterward. I'm going to Ranchito grill afterward. Oh, for sure. So, for sure. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we got another one from Apollo who says, honestly, after these few years of landing in his coaching staff, I'm learning not to be worried about recruiting until towards signing day. Gosh. They have always proven to be solid. Yeah. I think that's, that's spot on. I mean, they haven't given you any reason to, to worry about what they've been able to do uh, from a recruiting standpoint. Um, I think we can do some transfer portal talk too a little bit later on. Um, Ryan with a couple of big guys joining the team from the transfer portal uh, this next week. But yeah, I think landing obviously knows what he's doing. He learned how to do it at Alabama, learned how to do it even better at Georgia. And, um, and now he's, you know, picked right up where Mario Cristobal left off and clearly has a, uh, you know, passed, where he was able to get Oregon from a recruiting standpoint. So totally agree with this comment, Apollo. No, no reason to worry if you're an Oregon fan. I totally agree. It's a great time to be a duck, man. Yeah, absolutely. No yeah, I know. I think, uh, and again, like I said, I've never really focused that much on recruiting. Uh, I've always felt like these guys uh, have a really good handle on it. Even, even uh, in the previous uh, regime where, you know, it was, they were not really focused on the recruiting. I still wasn't worried because they had still got all these other guys. They recruited Marcus. They recruited all these other guys. I wasn't concerned about it. And then, and in, in, and even this, all the numbers and everything, I still am not, I, I the idea of like, you got to get this guy. Cause you got to get the better ranking and you got to have this. Now. That's fine to me in the modern era. You got to recruit. Well, you got to coach them up. You got to keep them. And then you got to add transfers. And I think that's the secret. You got to keep the good players and you got to add the transfers. 
And you, you've seen some teams where they didn't get to add transfers or they didn't get to uh, uh, keep their players or they didn't have the recruiting well, uh, you know, and, and you have to have all of them together. I mean, um, you know, look at this uh, Ducks basketball team this year down to freaking seven guys, you know, the eight, eight, seven scholarship guys. And a couple of those guys are transfers from this year. A couple of those guys are transfers from last year. You know, a couple of those guys are freshmen. You know, you need it. And then a couple of guys you had who you had brought on the whole time. You needed all those guys to come together. And that's, of course, basketball team where you have only have eight guys. Do that to a football team where it looks like more like 80 guys <laughs> or, you know, 50, 60 guys that you're getting a lot of rotation in with. It's a crazy situation. So you have to keep players. You know, look at the running back room. Running back room. If you had not had uh, Bucky and Noah come in as the transfers, you know, what would you have been doing in that running back room? You would have been in real trouble. I mean, just straight up. And there were other guys that came in and Jordan James did a great job as a freshman, guaranteed. But I mean, imagine if he as a freshman didn't have Bucky Irving or Noah Winnington. I mean, they would have been giving him the rock on day one. That would have been a crazy situation. So again, I, I feel like the transfer portal is is the secret of the whole sauce right now because guys can pick and choose where they want to go. It's basically free agency and you can plug and play guys and you know exactly what they're going to be able to bring to your table. And some guys are going to excel. Uh, some guys are going to do better than you thought, like a Tez Johnson, for example. Everybody knew Tez was good. Everybody, Bo, Bo told everybody he was good. You put on the tape, the guy's absolutely fast. He's got good hands. But then when he comes here and he has that success with Bo and everything else, he just jumps. And so it's like, you know, you get some of these guys who, they're, they're you know, without them in the transfer portal, you would have been really lean in that uh, department, right? Your, your wide receiver class would have been a little bit tighter. This year, wide receiver class is huge. That wide receiver room is teeming because a lot of guys want to come play here because look at the success these other guys have had. So, and then you guys, you get guys in the transfer portal and they stay an extra year. You, you got them for two years, like the Gary Bryant Jr. situation or whatever, you know, it just, it just builds on it. So to me, recruiting has never been more important. Even in the era of the transfer portal, recruiting is still really important because you're going to have to get guys who are going to come in and, and buy in from day one. You're also going to have to have to get some impact freshmen because freshmen are going to have to play. It's a new era. No, for sure. For sure. I think. Man, just to take a second here, Ryan, um, it looks like it's showing me in StreamYard that we got over 300 people in here Hell yeah. um, for for out. this chat. So shout out to everybody that's tuned in. Um, yeah. Drop a like on the video wherever you're or the stream, wherever you're watching. Um, you know, mTOR Sports here on Twitter or Oregon Football Max Taurus on YouTube. Subscribe to my channel. Subscribe to Ryan's channel, Sports Chat 503. And um, we're always here for the chat, man. We're here for the chat. Well, I'm, I could talk recruiting all day, but man, let's talk some Oregon football because it right. is about to be back with uh, with the Tuesday marking the third spring practice for the Ducks. And I think one of the things that everyone's most excited about is the Ducks will be adding two of their most highly anticipated transfers from the offseason in former Washington cornerback Jabbar Muhammad and former Texas A&M wide receiver Evan Stewart who posted on his Instagram story yesterday. I don't know if you saw this, Ryan, that, that he was in, that he was in Eugene. So kind of a, the Eagle has landed type of excitement. Um, I think that that's something that's just got everybody buzzing, man. You know, you add two of the top players in the transfer portal. Um, I think it's not necessarily an embarrassment of riches. I think it is kind of that deal, but like the wide receiver room is already great. You lose a guy like Troy Franklin. And before you can be bummed about it, you get a former five-star and Evan Stewart and not even just a former five-star that has a lot of hype, but like he's shown up on the field and he's played against some really good teams. You know, he went against um, Terry on Arnold, the cornerback from Alabama last year, and he's already seen a lot of top flight competition. And then Jabbar Muhammad, I mean, Oregon fans know all about Jabbar Muhammad. He was, a complete lockdown guy and the best corner in the pack last year. So for them to be able to add him as a plug and play replacement to um, Kyrie Jackson, how can you not love that? Right. No, I, I, I totally agree. And, and and I think that, you know, you, 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 you referenced the two big ones, but I would also say that the other two big ones are those two quarterbacks, right? Uh, the, the idea that, you know, Dylan Gabriel uh, being one of the high ranked names, it's that one year contract thing. But Dante Moore, I feel like, has got even more hype than anything else, man, because 
of all of what happened last year. And that idea of falling in love with a guy his senior year when he commits, then he decommits the last second, breaks your heart. The next year comes back to the team. I mean, so the storylines are abundant. They are absolutely abundant. And um, again, I, I, I tend to think that the spring is one of the best times of the year because you've got a lot of different storylines to work with. You've got the guys that are up and coming. You got the guys that are trying to hold on to a spot against those up and coming guys. And then you got the newcomers and you got all these faces, all these different names and position groups. Basically, they just come in there. They take the eraser to the board and they say, OK, guys, let's go. Who wants to be on that board? <laughs> and there's nothing more motivating than erasing all those names and and, and, and putting new names up. So I, I love the fact that the Ducks are um, absolutely on fire when it comes to recruiting, transfers. People want to be a part of this team. They're going into this conference. They're going to have huge games this year. They're going to be marquee matchups. They're going to be national uh, news every single week. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a great year. It's, it's one of the most surreal years of being a Duck fan to look forward to. Not to mention the fact it's my son's freshman year at Oregon. Dude, <laughs> I can't just it, the layers continue, Max. It just it's blowing my mind. Hard to hard to ask for a better uh intro for Darby into uh his college years and I mean for him to already have the experience that he does shooting the ducks and being around the team um I think that's awesome um you know super glad that I've gotten to work with him he does some amazing work I know he's got some new some new um camera stuff he was telling me I think when he was right. um shooting some hoops out there in Las Vegas um shout out to this comment from Shant uh from Pasadena California Huge shout out to you both. Love watching you both. Appreciate the love yeah. um, and the kind words. Um, staying on the topic Shan, of like transfers. That, Cheers to you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. So I think staying staying on top of uh, with some of these transfers. Um, we got one a comment from Rick Olson. We'll DM probably Dante Moore play in his free four games. Um, I I tend to think probably. Um, I mean, why, why would you not take advantage of those four games? If you're this Oregon staff, um, just trying to prepare him to potentially be Dylan Gabriel's successor. And I think this is an interesting point because so many people I think have already kind of anointed him as the next guy for Oregon. And, and maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case, but I think it could be a little bit short sighted to overlook the rest of the quarterbacks in that room because Austin Novosad has been around for a little bit. He knows the system. Will Stein was talking a lot earlier on in spring practice about how much he's grown as a quarterback and just being comfortable in the system um, and, and being around Oregon. And then you have Luke Moga who you bring in from the 2024 class. Um, and then you have Achille Smith coming in in 2025, uh, Achille Smith jr. In 2025. So I think that Dante Moore is probably, it'd be smart for him to play in his four games, um, just to, to get some quality reps in this offense and to get some good reps against the, um, the opponents that they're going to be facing in the, in the big 10 moving forward. Absolutely, man. Um, no, I just, you know, everybody's focused on the quarterback, the quarterback's like the CEO, man. It's like, you know, they're the president, man. Everybody, everybody loves the quarterback and, and it's just become more and more and more of that position over time. You know, I, I thought there was, might've been a time. Uh, where it would cool down a little bit and, and it wouldn't be that number one A1 focus, but it's even gotten more. You know, I mean, you watch the NFL advertisements and they don't even say, you know, Chiefs versus, uh, you know, the Bills. They say it's Josh Allen versus Patrick Mahomes. You know, it's it, it, it the entire team is represented by two quarterbacks, you know, and that half the time just get the ball from one place to the other and let everybody else work, you know. But, um, they are important, and uh, I, I do think Dylan Gabriel just throws a really nice ball, and uh, and he's just an athletic guy. Coming out of the left side, a little different, uh, but he, you know, I I love as basketball coach for all the years that I've had. All the lefties I've ever coached have very nice touch on the ball for whatever reason, and it feels like the left-handed quarterbacks do as well. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about this team. Again, I just I feel like offensively, a lot of questions were answered last year with Will Stein when. You know, you went from Kenny Dillingham to Will Stein. You're thinking, okay, is this, is this offense going to get better or worse? You had a lot of really good playmakers there. And obviously, I think a lot of it had to go with how Bo played because I think Bo played so well. But I think he was put in a position to play very well. 
you know, and uh, I think Willie, uh, you know, uh, is just one of those guys who just, he knows the game so well, man. And uh, I think he is a quarterback at heart. He knows how the quarterback should be played. He knows how the game should work a little bit. I think he's very funny. Every single interaction I have with Will Stein I, is, is immediately laughing. There's, there's, there's a lot of humor and a lot of intelligence with him. And he just knows how to work the room a little bit. I think it, the key thing for me and the quarterback as a coach, myself personally, hierarchy is really important and you got to have transparency. Everybody needs to know who the number one is. Number two is number three is everybody needs to know that hierarchy. And you know, like last year, uh, you knew exactly what you had going on because Bo Nix was coming back for that senior year. But his first year when he transferred in, remember the people were like, well, let's see how this will go. <laughs> you know, when he was obviously going to be the starter, he's not going to come over here and not be the starter. I kept saying that over and over and over. But the spring game is, like I said, clean off the board, do all the stuff, do all the natural stuff where everybody gets a shot. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I love the spring game because people are hungry for it. And everything's spaced out as well, which I really like. So you have like, you know, you have a practice, you have a day off, you have another practice, you got some time off on the weekends a little bit. It's not like just go, 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 go all the time. And there have been years where they did do that. They have been years where they really tried to jam all those practices in a very short amount of time and get the whole thing done. You know, Chip Kelly talks about the win the day thing. The win the day motto came from spring practice. It came from the idea that the spring was just such a a doldrum of times where there was nothing really going on. You had no game going on. You had no opponent. You just had to just go through the motions. And it was, you know, it, it was just, it was just like a, a throwaway. And Chip was like, you got these 15 practices. We need to use these correctly. And this is when he was at New Hampshire. And this idea of this win the day idea was, okay, let's just focus on today. I know the rest of the season's like, you know, six months from now or whatever, but let's just focus on today. And, uh, I love that. Uh, so to me, my, my, my whole thing about spring practices is, is, is it gets us talking about football again, and it gets the guys able to put the pads on again, start popping again a little bit. And really for these guys, they get to work on their craft. And there's nothing more important for a, a coach, for a player, uh, to allow guys to work on their craft and get better. And you see guys get a lot better over the spring, especially when it comes to the wide receiver group uh, working with the quarterback. And that's going to be a big thing this year with these brand new quarterbacks. Quarterbacks are always going to be a, a fun topic of conversation, right? It's only natural that they kind of dominate the conversation, the discussion, um, especially because it's the most important position on the field. Absolutely. And um, I think it's it's a cool storyline too, right? I don't think you could draw it up better as far as Dante Moore being an Oregon commit and then decommitting and then ending up back in Eugene despite um, all the all the chaos around the sport with with Chip Kelly in UCLA to, to become the new OC at Ohio State. Um, or, or, um, you know, Dylan Gabriel coming to Oregon and then Dante Moore still comes to Oregon. Like that was something that not a lot of people expected because you usually don't get two guys of that caliber out of the portal at quarterback in, in the same hall. So, um, I think Dylan, Ga uh, Dylan Gabriel and Dante Moore have to be two of the guys that are at the very top of my list that I'm most excited to see in the, in the spring game moving forward this year um for for later next month and then obviously jabbar muhammad's another one and and evan stewart as well um got an interesting comment here from ne says i can't believe i'm saying this the only worry i have this year is that the interior of the d-line what do we think ryan you know interior d-line um yeah i think there's uh there there's a reason for concern there because of who you lost last year you know you you had some really strong players uh, that had been there a while and you, you know, in, in the other big thing about transfer portal and all this sort of stuff is it's hard to grow football players. These guys are gigantic human beings. And I don't know if you've seen like Ryan walk lately shouts out to Ryan walk came back as a coach, but he's probably dropped almost a hundred pounds since he was playing. I mean, the guy is back to being like a point guard, right? This guy was a point guard for Justin Herbert. I don't know if you know this at Shelton High School. But, you know, that my, my point being is that these guys get gigantically huge and they swell back down when they stop playing. A lot of these defensive linemen are not necessarily always that big, right? They get big for their sport. And during their couple of years, it's hard to get an 18-year-old to be that big comparatively to some of these grown men, right? And so, you know, I think Keon Ware Hudson is going to be a guy because of his ability to be a senior on that team. He's been here. He's been around. I think he, he knows where he's going with uh, with that group. You know, there's some freshmen in here that might make a difference right away. Uh, and and then, of course, you have the, the transfers. I think the transfers are going to be a big deal. 
Um, a guy who I personally like to see is, is Ben Roberts. Okay. I think that uh, Benjamin, I think is, is a guy who's going to make, take that next level of progression up. Um, so again, that's kind of my concept. You have to have the guys that you recruited as freshmen. You got to coach them up. You got to let them hit the meal plan and the weights, right? Then you got to get the guys who are transfers who are going to come in with already some weights, already some meal plan stuff, come in as a sophomore or junior, or maybe even come in as a senior. Um, but you're going to have to kind of develop this as a unit. And I, I would say that it's going to be a little bit of an issue, but people thought that the offensive line was going to be an issue last year, and it was not. And I think that you have a, a new collection of guys come in, and you'll have to kind of work these guys in as they can. But, you know, you might have some 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 freshmen plan uh, because there just might be a little bit less guys in there. Uh, but, um, you know, there's other guys who'd come in uh, as transfers, uh, seniors who might be uh, might be real nice. So I don't think you're going to have a dominant, dominant defensive line this next year. I think you're going to have a very athletic defense that's going to cover for that lack of a definite do dominant defensive line. As long as you can be a run stuffer and allow your linebackers to be clean, I think your linebackers are going to absolutely eat this year, man. So Again, and I think you're going to put pressure on the edge. I think guys, uh, you know, if, if you're limited on the DL, maybe you mean your DN maybe has to step up a little bit, or your outside backers have to step up a little bit. But to me, I just think you need to take on a double team and and let other guys go and eat. And that's that's my number one thing about being a, as a former defensive lineman myself, uh, who one of my coaches just said literally dive on the ground and allow people to jump on top of you. That was the best thing that this position could do i was like what so we're not like run after the quarterback and tackle and like get sacks and stuff no just like literally just dive on the ground and create a pile yep i said well i, I think i should do the other thing on the defensive i think i'm a little bit more <laughs> let, 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 let's let this guy here who's already built like a pile of people let's him him, him dive on the ground <laughs> and then the best defensive uh, lineman i ever played against was like a, a wrestler he was I don't even think he was he was more than 200 pounds and he ate these guys alive. He was a smaller defensive lineman and he absolutely ate these guys alive. So I I come at it from a perspective of you don't need to be 320 330 pounds. You don't need to be built like a guy. You know Jordan Scott comes to example, comes to mind, right? A classic gigantic huge defensive tackle. Plug the gaps, right? He can take two or three gaps. His size alone looks like two or three gaps. And and he did great. And who was his linebacker? The most successful linebacker in Oregon history, right? And so you have Troy Dye back there just absolutely eating this thing up, just getting stats on stats on stats on stats. Why? Because he had a good run stopper in front of him that could plug holes, okay? Now, I, I don't think there's anybody on this line that could do what Jordan did his freshman year. And Jordan did that basically on size alone. He didn't even have the technique really that he really knew yet. He said his technique grew in time over time, and he actually became – Maybe less prolific, less run stop at the minute, you know what I'm saying? Which is crazy to think about. So defensive line to me, I'm not trying to undervalue that position. It is very valuable, but I think you can get away with not having a super dominant defensive line with having some good guys on the edge and having some good guys as your backers. I, I got um, a separate D line topic that's related that I want to kind of get your thoughts on in a second here, but um one thing that kind of came to my mind, Ryan, while you were giving your piece on on the Oregon D line, um, you got some good pieces in place already, right? It's not like the cupboard's bare by any means. Jordan Birch comes back, uh, Mateo comes back. I, by the way, I saw Mateo last weekend at Under Armour LA. I posted a picture on my Twitter, and the dude is just a gigantic human being. I mean, I, I saw him a lot when he was at St. John Bosco, and I was covering him as a senior, but he is clearly. I don't even know how to ballpark it, like probably put on like 20 pounds or something. And he was already giant coming out of high school. So um, big, big, really big, fun. Big Dave, big Dave, I think he said he's about 275. But the but the, the thing there is that he was built a lot more like a tight end when he was in high school, right? Mm -hmm. And now he's built more like a defensive. He's built like a defensive end. I, I think the defensive tackle, the classic defensive tackle look, right? He'll, he'll never have because he's so tall. Sure. The classic sure. defensive tackle look is just just about as wide as you are tall. It's six six foot three thirty. I mean, six two three. You know those guys. Those, those guys are not. You know, a guy like Haloti Nada kind of uh, is, is a little different because he's six four. You know, not a lot of those guys because it's low man wins that position. So sure. But the defensive ends, yeah, man. Birch, I think is going to have a huge year. And then, and then, um, I mean, 
kind of along that mold that you were talking about, like six foot, six one, three thirty. I think that's exactly where Jamari Caldwell's at, uh, the exactly. Houston defensive line transfer. So um, he he comes in and he's going to play a huge role this year. I know Tosh Lapoy was talking about how they're just kind of asking him to do more than he's maybe used to doing uh, in previous years at Houston, but he's a guy who has run stopping ability and pass rush ability. So he can impact the game that way as well. And then you have guys like Amari Washington, Ben Roberts, you talked about Michael Gardner, uh, Keon where Hudson's back for another year. But then like, what do you see from some of these young guys that we didn't hear from too much last year, like a Terrence green or a Johnny Bowens, um, Ashton Porter. Um, I think we're going to hear a lot from some of these guys that you see them and you're kind of like, Oh, I forgot about him. I forgot he was in Eugene. I forgot he was, you know, I didn't expect to maybe hear from him this season. But the the interesting thing that I was thinking about while you were talking, Ryan, that I wanted to kind of float out there. Remember when Oregon was transitioning from Adrian Clem to Alik Terry and they lost all those starters on the O-line? Your, your Ryan Walks, Forsyth, TJ Bass, Sala, all those guys left. And what was the talking point for much of the offseason? well, Oregon's offensive line is going to take a step back and you bring in a new coach given it's someone who has familiarity with Oregon. Elite Terry was a GA on the Oregon staff before some of his previous stops, but that was the, the widespread belief. Oh, Oregon's losing all these guys. They're going to take a step back and the O line isn't going to be as good. And it was just as good, if not probably better uh, in 2023. So who's to say that something similar can't happen on the D line. I don't know. I'd be kind of curious to get your guys' thoughts, your thoughts too, Ryan. Like, I think the talent's certainly there. It's just a question mark right now because we haven't seen very much from that group. We haven't seen a lot of these guys on the field taking reps, those good on good reps to maybe be able to say, oh, that's likely that they will be able to have a similar kind of transition um, that you had recently uh, from Adrian Clum to Elite Terry just on the other side of the ball. What do we think there? I, I would agree, man. I, I think that I think you're going to see something very similar. I, you're in the position now where it's, and again, not to be like egotistical about this or like, you know, too ahead of our skis, but they used to talk about, you know, the teams that could just reload, right? And they wouldn't have to like completely rebuild something. They could just reload and they would take a team that was really good and they'd be like, oh, this is the greatest offensive line in Oregon history. And then the next year they would, have a brand new group and be like, now this is the best line in Oregon history statistically now. And then, then the next, I mean, w- did, did anybody think that JPJ when he came in as a freshman would be better than Alex Forsyth as senior as, 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 as at the center position. And he definitely was, I mean, JBJ was an absolute beast at the center, dude. Guy was me. No offense to Alice. Alice was awesome too. Okay. Like you can keep going back, right? Max hunger, keep going back. So it's this idea that like, I think the future is very bright. We've said this on here when it comes to recruiting, the players coming in are better than the players from the past. So a guy like Josh Connerly, for example, should have an absolutely humongous year this year, right? He's on track to be that guy came in as the best guy played as a freshman, had a great sophomore year should just have a dominant junior year and be off to the NFL draft. And I feel like sometimes what we lose focus on is some of these guys who didn't have that chance as a freshman. There were guys playing in front of them as a freshman and they didn't have that opportunity. And maybe they weren't good enough comparatively, but they also just maybe didn't have that free spot in front of them. Maybe they had to two or three guys in front of them. They had to work through. Um, and, and you're going to have to do that. Some of these guys leave in the transfer portal to try to find uh, an area where they don't have as many uh, guys competing with them. But I tend to think guys that are really working hard, that really know their craft, uh, are, are going to excel. And this is the time to excel. And again, different schemes come with different players. And we came out of a very big defensive and offensive line mindset with the crystal ball era. And I think you're moving toward a m- little bit more traditional, uh, approach up front, but also speed, speed, speed. And Dan Lanning has said speed over and over and over in uh, in, in, in a variety of different interviews when talking about these position groups. And I'm assuming that even on the defensive line, it's still going to be like that. Look what Dorla, look what Doralis just did in the uh, in the uh, NFL draft combine, right? He ran a great 40. So you're, I think you're going to see a lot of these guys come in, uh, try to maintain their speed and try to have that uh, physical strength and size as well. I don't think the 330 pound 
thing is necessarily as important or 300 pound thing is important as, as, as it used to be. I think you can get around that a little bit. Uh, but I think defensively, I think the key thing is you're going to have these great linebackers. You're going to have some seriously good linebackers this year. Last year, you were thinking you were a little bit uh, lean on it with Justin Jacobs coming up that injury and whatnot. Uh, but I think you're going to have a great linebacker core. And like you said, we only have, there's only two defensive ends on the, on the roster right now. It's Mateo and Jordan Birch. And both those guys look like absolute studs. So I think the defense will be fine. And I think that the, uh, the defensive line, although it is very important and I live by the code that whoever wins that upfront battle, defense and offensive line is going to win the ball game. Uh, I still think you'll be fine. And I think that there's guys coming up who are going to really, uh, really shine. Another question to get to here from mighty Oregon. Thanks for the question. Cool. Max slash Ryan, every Duck fan wants Oregon to be elite. What needs to be done to get us to the highest level, a.k.a. probably, winning a natty? And this is a good question. This is a really good question because it's one that is kind of always at the forefront of your thinking. I think whether you're a coach on this staff, whether you're in the personnel side of things, scouting eval you're always wondering what's going to get there and i think one of the easiest ways to get yourself there and i think one area we really saw oregon take a pretty notable step last year but it's not where it needs to be yet is you're too deep you need to i think the best teams in the country the best teams in college football are so deep that you can suffer an injury or have a guy miss time at any given position and you're just as confident that there's a guy that you're that you have on that roster say hey you go out there and you know there's not going to be any kind of a drop off there so i feel like that is one of the the areas that oregon needs to um kind of the next step to get to that next level is just having a, a bona fide too deep i also think you need to lock things down in the secondary a bit more that was an area where i don't think oregon was quite where they needed to be last year not trying to you know slight that group or anything i think that's just the reality of the situation i feel like the coaches would probably tell you that as well and then you just need to keep on uh bringing in monster pass rushers i think that that's uh exactly what you need those are kind of some of the the simplest things to simplest boxes to check not simplest but most straightforward things that you need to do if you really want to get to that winning and any level yeah i mean things have definitely changed because of the 12 team format Okay. Right. So it's like you positioning really is going to matter now. Right. So, uh, you know, you, you got to get yourself in those first four games, get your bye, where you got to get in that second four where you get your home game and you get on a run and you start to kind of really feel it. But either way, I mean, it, back in the day, it used to be, you had to win your, your, your one or two big games, uh, on your schedule. And you had to, uh, you know, just play clean in the bowl game. And, and play a good bowl game. And always bowl games, you know, are a weird game, right? Historically, your, your offense doesn't show up or your it's, it's a defensive battle on two offensive teams or it's an offensive showdown with two defensive-minded teams or whatever the case may be. It's always strange for the most part. But to me, defense wins championships. And it's always been Oregon's opportunity to have a great offense, but maybe have the defense uh, let them down a little bit. And then you had some some really good years with your really good defense, and uh, and you were playing against an incredible offense somewhere else that was was tough to beat, you know, like that uh, Ohio State offense, right? Um, so again, I think that size matters. You know, historically, uh, you, 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 we we didn't match up with the SEC on the line. That was always the discussion. Remember that with the first national championship, but Oregon's been so damn close. They're basically at the place where it's just about how the ball bounces and you know they lost by a very very slim margin to that auburn team that auburn team was great uh they they end up getting kind of blown out by that na uh, national championship ohio state game but they were close most of that game um they've had years where they probably had a better team but they didn't get the chance to play for it uh so a lot of it's like chance man but to me it's all about defensive uh, uh mindset first and foremost because Football is still a game where you can take the ball away from the other team and give it back to your offense. And if your offense is good and your defense can start taking the ball away, it gets really wild and it gets demoralizing fast. So defense to me always is the, the secret weapon. And like my dad has always said, hey, man, in Oregon, whenever Oregon has a good defense, watch out. That's always his line, man. So it's like that's what separates the best Oregon teams uh, from everywhere, every other year. So um, you got to have really, really good, talented DBs that uh you know 
that, that, that can play on an island. Look at what happened with, you know, Penix last year and Adunze. When they needed they get that first down or that touchdown, they did. And it was right there. Even though you had great defense, you had guys all over them, it was still right there. So what are you going to do? <laughs> How are you going to do that? Like you said, you got to put a pass rush on the guy. You got to knock it off the spot. But you know, it's hard to be the best team in the country. It's really difficult. And everybody's trying to be that best team. And it's going to get more difficult. You know, you got to start with being the best team in your division. And you got to be the best team in your conference. You know, to be the best team in the country every single year, uh, it, it, it's a little demoralizing when you don't meet that goal. At the same time, the Ducks are really freaking close, man. I mean, out of everybody in the country, they are like right there. They might not be at the at, at the first table, but they're definitely at the second table most years. From the last like 15 years, they've been there, except for, of course, the one, couple years with the bad year, Hellfrich and whatnot. They've been right there knocking on the door, and they've had some teams that could be uh, competitive there. They just never got their chance. And I think if you compare, maybe you compare last year to the 2019 team, Herbert's last year uh -huh. when they had that dominant defense under Andy Avalos. And I think it's an interesting comparison because I don't think Oregon's offense was necessarily elite. there. certainly not as lethal as it probably should have been with Justin Herbert leading this offense. I mean, we all know that Mario Cristobal didn't really want to let him have it, let him, let him let it rip uh, from a quarterback perspective. So like, that's like one of the greatest. What ifs is like, what if Justin Herbert was fully utilized uh, his talents um, while he was at Oregon, what he, what if he could have been utilized better. Um, but also just look at the DBs. I mean, I think if you're comparing Oregon's defensive back play last year to that 2019 season, I think you had special guys at, at both of those spots, whether it was Javon Holland, who's now in all pro safety for the dolphins in the NFL or um, Diamador Lenore, who, who is, um, you know, on my Niners and um, really carving out a nice role for himself in the NFL as one of the better cornerbacks I think at least in the NFC West, um, maybe not so much in the entire NFL, but I think it's, it's refreshing to see him sticking around. So I think that the pass rush is that area where they, I think they really need to continue growing. Uh, last year was a step in the right direction, but I also think just having more consistent high level top end DB play. And they're certainly recruiting the guys to do just that. Chris Hampton gets a promotion to deep defensive backs coach where Shabwa dude takes on a bigger role with the corners after Demetrius Martin leaves to go back to Michigan state, his alma mater to coach for Jonathan Smith. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, reason for optimism, a lot of pieces in the, uh, in, a lot of pieces in place for the ducks to make some serious noise. Um, Ryan, we're already at an hour, man. Um, we, we are getting a lot of great comments here in the chat. And uh, a lot of good questions. Um, what's your vibe, man? You want to keep going a little bit? What are you thinking? I know you go like three hours on this thing sometimes, but I haven't done it in a while. Uh, yeah, no, we're good. We're good. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, 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 I'm just uh, looking into this. Uh, I saw a, a, a comment about Coach Locke. The rumors about Coach Locke, uh, Coach uh, Lachlan, about uh, maybe going to Ohio State. That's what they. That's what the internet is now thinking. Pretty I wild saw, yeah. Stuff. I saw one of those. Um, I saw one of those comments too. I mean, <clears throat> it's always interesting to see. Did they just right, sign him to a new two-year deal? Like, two well, yeah, that was the <clears throat> that was the thing um, about uh, that I was seeing pop up in my feed because people were quote tweeting my story when I, 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 I guess you know you call it aggregating. I, I wrote one of those stories. Report: Carlos Lachlan signs contract extension with Oregon per Matt Zenitz of Two Four Seven Sports. So. I was putting it out there, but it wasn't my report. I was writing something about somebody else's report. You know, if you read sports journalism, you know, it happens all the time. Um, so I think it's been interesting to look at Carlos Lachlan's impact at Oregon. And I, I don't have any information on this specifically. Um, but you look at all the big jobs that have come open at running back this year, Georgia with Del McGee taking the, the Georgia state job. Um, and then, um, obviously Tony Alford leaving Ohio state to, to go to Michigan. Um, I think that that's obviously one of those top, top running back jobs, right? You know, Ohio state has a long history of great backs. Um, I think Texas is another one you have to look at as well. Um, I know Ole Miss just landed one of the top running backs in the country, uh, an in-state guy in Ackland deer. So I don't know. I think this is going to be Wild an interesting times. one to keep an eye on to see 
if anything new develops on uh on this front yeah yeah wild times man i mean i have i i had i knew nothing of it until i just saw the the tweet so i'm i'm not really up on the whole like uh you know the, the breaking news you know i'll get to it kind of a thing you know I'm, I, 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 some of the stuff I, I'm, I'm hip to a little bit, I've heard maybe some scuttlebutt about, but I, I'm not that much of a conspiracy theorist. I don't really have my ear to the, you know, too much, whatever. But it, I, I do think it's always funny. This is the time of year where it happens, you know. But he's been he's been great, man. I think I think Coach Locke's been great. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if he comes, he goes. If there's another one coming up, <laughs> the next coach is gonna be great too, man. I'll tell you what, I'm not I'm not that worried about it. Yeah, because I mean, Dan Lanyon has has proven to be a very good, um, you know, hiring coach, like a coach that excels yeah. in hiring the right He's guys. Like exactly. So I think it's not it's not something that you need to, um, you know, be worried about if if that were to um, be the be the reality of things. So um, I'm a huge Coach Lock fan. I mean, he's been tremendous at Oregon, um, a huge star on this staff. So. We'll just have to keep our eyes out and, and see what um what comes if anything of uh of you know that rumor or some some smoke uh on that uh on that front. Um, let's see what else I had here. I see, I see really quickly in the chat. There's a couple of people. I see QB 11s in here. QB 11 does a great job. He got a podcast. Oh Shout yeah. Out to, shouts out to him. He does a great job. Uh, and then uh, Jackson Johnson in here talking about Happy Easter. Let's go Easter. We're we, we, we didn't get to get too deep in this and on my channel. It'd be immediately asking how many meats at the, at the, uh, the dinner. How, how many, you, we got to get some food chat here. What are you going? Well, well what, what, what is the normal thing for Easter? It's gotta be the ham, right? That's the normal thing. Or is it roast or what do you, what do you do? Hopefully it's not yeah. duck. I don't know. Are you, are you a, uh, I mean, I'm not a, I, I don't, <laughs> we have got, we have entered food chat. Here We're doing on... porchetta. This thing is like a, you know, spiced kind of thing, porchetta and a salmon. That's my, that's my family's that they're doing that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I'm not really big as far as, you know, some kind of Easter tradition in, in my family, but I think I was telling you before we went live that my mom and I are going to do, um, the big breakfast tomorrow. So, Classic. um, that's what I'm looking forward to, you know, sausage, potatoes, uh, quiche, coffee, mm. uh, yeah. Belvita. I always love my blueberry Belvita. That's my that's my morning that's my morning thing. ritual. Is I, I I wake wake up, brew some coffee, throw some creamer in there, and then um I get uh I get some blueberry Belvita and do a little bit of morning reading. That's it's I, I didn't start doing that until I was in Eugene and it was COVID. So that was like somewhere I found it. I found my structure and my peace amid all the chaos. It's nice. Uh, Rick's going Easter tamales. I like that play. There you uh, go. Yeah, no. So, what are, what are your thoughts then on so who, maybe so who maybe some of the people you're looking for uh, in the spring? Who do you think could be the uh, rising stars of the spring? Uh, rising stars of the spring. That is a great question. I think one that guy that's surely got to be there is Jurion Dickey. He's oh, someone who God. um Will Will Stein was super super excited about him in um in his presser um following Oregon's second spring practice earlier this month and. I think it was really interesting to see what he had to say because because he was kind of just saying like it takes time and like it took him time to get comfortable in the system to you know know where to line up know where what routes to run know what audibles are out there whatever it is you know know how to evaluate the defense that's that you're looking at so I thought that was a really good thing to hear because I think in my line of work, you always want the highly rated recruits to play right away, but it's just not the reality of the situation uh, more often than not. So um, I think there's so many catches to go around uh, in this um, Oregon offense for a couple of reasons, because Troy Franklin's gone. He had something like 75, 80 catches and then Bucky Irving's gone and he caught like 50 passes for the ducks. So um, even though they have a lot of returners, uh, with Treshawn Holden, Gary Bryant, Tez Johnson, Evan Stewart comes in. I think there's still going to be some some catches there for Jurion, and uh, he's healthy. He's in shape. He's taking the ball off defenders' heads. Is what Will Stein was saying. So I think spring risers, you got to look at Jurion Dickey as someone who could be right in the thick of that conversation. Um, and then defensively, I've been hearing a little bit of buzz um, coming coming out of Eugene, and, or maybe it wasn't Eugene actually, but 
a little bit of buzz about Nico Reed maybe making some some strides in that cornerback room, which would be an awesome development for the Ducks. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about some of the uh, – maybe some of the newcomers, uh, who, some of the freshmen who might play? Yeah, freshmen that might play. Um, that'll be an interesting one. Um, I think – Let's see. I think if you're looking at uh, Aaron Flowers as a guy who okay. is um, is really intriguing, that safety out of the state of Texas, he was an All-American guy. Ducks need some help at safety. Of course, you return Taishim Johnson, and you get Kobe Savage out of K-State from the portal. Um, I'm just trying to think. Flowers think looks the part, though. He, he, he He's a pretty big dude. Yeah, yeah, he, and he was a top performer. Yeah. Um, out in San Antonio. So I think he's someone you got to be excited about. Uh, Braden Platt in that linebacker room. I mean, he's a, a freak athlete, kind of a guy, uh, a top track star, also played running back for Yelm. Um, who else do we have here? Dylan Gresham at wide receiver. Um, Jeremiah McClellan, Elijah Rushing, maybe. Maybe he kind of takes on a role similar to Mateo. All right. You're um, gonna I think, say, outside backer group might be a little thin too. There might not be that many guys over there, right? I don't think it's as thin as some people think. I mean, you lose Mace Funa from a year ago, but you still have Blake Purchase, Tatum Tuioti, uh, a Marion Winston, a Portland guy um, who, who's pretty young. And, and I hear good things about him from some of the conversations that I have. So he he's someone to be excited about for sure. If you're looking forward to what this defense can do in 2024, um, having a combination of some returners and some young guys, I think with Elijah rushing, he's going to maybe need to work on his body a little bit. Yeah. Um, listed at 6'6", 251 on 247 Sports, but um, looks when kind I of stood, skinny. When I stood next to him, he was, looked thin. He, he When I stood next to him, he looked like a when basketball did you player. you see him? At the basketball game. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I took a picture with him where he's he's a true 6'6". He's like basketball height. Okay. Right? It, 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 and, he, and he felt basketball size. <laughs> he didn't feel football size. <laughs> He, sure. he can definitely fill out, but you, you're right. I mean, you just that that position is one that it can you can you can look a variety of different body types, right? For sure, for sure. So I think we're we're hitting on some you know some guys that we think. Um, I think um, I think you're right though. Go back about the outside linebacker, the way that Blake Purchase played last year, the way that Tatum Tuoti played last year, and even Marion Winston a little bit. But now I'm telling you, Blake Purchase blew my mind last year with his play. He played very well. And he he was a guy that I heard a lot of really good things about in um coming out of high school, coming out of the state of Colorado. I mean, he he uh was one of those letters of intent that took a little bit longer to come in than I think the staff would have liked. And the reason was because Deion Sanders was trying to flip him, getting to get him to stay home and play for his his home state. Um, and I was talking to somebody that was very tied into that recruitment when purchase was coming out and you know, they were telling me like, Max, this guy is going to be a dude. Like he was super, super excited about him. And um, I think it's they just so correct. fun. So fun to see Oregon recruit nationally, any state. Um, and, and Colorado isn't one that I think gets a whole lot of buzz. Obviously it produced uh, the McCaffrey brothers uh, in recent years. Um, if you're looking even at Oregon, Adrian Jackson came out of Colorado never quite figured it out of Oregon, but ducks have some history there in Colorado. So I think that uh, it's exciting to see what Blake purchase has done and, and kind of what, what remains for him. Uh, what's ahead for him. Um, got a comment here from Brandon. Be great to see that Juco play uh, this year in the secondary. I think you're talking about Sione Laulea from college of San Mateo. Um, he was the number two Juco prospect in the entire country. And he's like six, 185 pounds. Um, I, the secondary is, I, I even know you have a lot of guys coming back there, Ryan, maybe this can be one of our topics to kind of wind it down. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, what do you think about the secondary, man? Cause you've got a lot of players coming back, but I think that it's also going to be a combination of like, okay, who's on the roster that we like where they're at. And we think there's still room to grow versus we have some new guys that were adding into the mix here. And some of the guys that they're going to be pushing, you kind of just have to look at it and say, hey, that uh, wasn't quite good enough. It wasn't up to our standard last year. That's a great point. You know, the the, the way it's been working lately, it, it, it seems as if there's always going to be, uh, like you're saying, these kind of two different levels, right? The guys that were good, who came in, had a lot of talent, a lot of potential, 
maybe never really reached their potential. Other guys came in at a class below them or maybe even two classes below them and hit at the level of potential before the other guys. Other guys switch positions back there. They go from safety to DB or DB to safety, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of movement back there in that group. To me, I think that the transfers have been very big for them, right? We look at Christian Gonzalez, what he did in year one was gigantic. I mean, holy smokes. So to me, I I, I look at a guy like, uh, you know, like you said, Nico Reed, get one more year in it. I think he played very well last year. But Kobe Savage to me is a guy who, again, these are all grouped together as when it comes to the safeties and the DBs all in one unit I'm, look, I'm thinking of. But, and I'd love to see a guy like Dante Manning who have an opportunity to have a, 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 a you know, senior year, be able to come out. You saw him in that, um, we were talking about the uniforms to start things off. You saw him in that video with the uniforms. You know, a guy who, when, when needed last year, when he was the number one guy, I thought played very well. And, uh, you know, uh, when his number was called last year, I thought he did great. Uh, I think, obviously, people are, are, are focused on Tysheem Johnson. Um, but there's other guys, like you said, there's other guys who are going to come in and, uh, and push for some of those spots. That's why I love the spring, because in the spring, you get to really see who wants it. And you're going to have some guys that you know you can depend on when it comes to the fall that are, are going to be slotted in already. But they might have to work for how much uh, they're going to get, how many, how many snaps they're going to get. Um, Jaleel Florence is a guy I think I'm really high on. I would love to see him uh, really jump on it. And then your guy, Rod Pleasant, man. Uh, you know, I would love to see what we could do with him because of his speed and whatnot. So there's a, there's a bunch of guys in that room. It's a deep room. Um, you know, I thought Cody DeCambria was a guy I was really excited for when he came in on his group. Um, so again, I just think you never really know. That's when I want to, uh, the big statement on that one is like you said about Aaron Flowers, like you never really know this. He could be a guy that could play as a freshman or he mm -hmm. could be a guy that doesn't see the field until his sophomore year and barely sees the field then you know we're, we're projecting it out to where we think is going to happen and and chances are he will see the field more than he won't but again crazy things happen in this game obviously injuries but guys sometimes make a, a big jump and they were hitting their uh off season hard maybe somebody else wasn't Maybe they got kind of a, a a new lease on life. Maybe they were working out with somebody else who gave them a little bit of tips here and there. Because again, some of these guys, the difference in their talent is not that much. It's just about who wants it more and who's willing to take the 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 the, the next steps to get to where they need to go. So, I love the spring as a as a coach for all the years that I've coached. This is a time where you can really, like I said, erase that board and get everybody pumped up to go get their spot and and see who wants it. It feels only fitting in spring ball. With this, uh, with this theme, I don't know if you look of the the season and um, like spring cleaning, fresh start, right. all that kind of thing. I think that can very much be applied to um, probably this Oregon defense because at the end of the day, that's just where more of the questions lie. So it's only natural that you kind of see some more wiggle room um, from a couple of those positions. I, I like that you mentioned Rod Pleasant. Uh, Rod Pleasant, uh, Dakota Fields, two Sarah guys. They were yep. teammates in high school and now they're teammates once again. Rod Pleasant had an awesome play, forcing a fumble in the Fiesta Bowl against Liberty. Um, and I think the secondary is just it's teaming with talent, and there's so many guys at corner, at safety, at nickel. Uh, Brandon Johnson comes over from Duke as well, um, who joins the team during spring practice. He, he like wasn't here. here. Yeah, yeah. So I think he's another guy that you got to be excited about. Um, there was another point I was going to make. Oh, I was talking to Spencer about this the other day. Um, maybe I'll steal it now and just kind of bring it to the table. Um, real quick, Ryan, how, how about we end at uh, an hour and a half? We're at an hour and 18. Is that okay? Just yeah, yeah. kind of yeah, have that be our hard stop. We're here. Um, but here's the question. Um, Jabbar Muhammad, since we're talking about the, the secondary, right? Um, Jabbar Muhammad comes in. Crazy big expectations. Crazy big expectations. The dude went to the national championship with Washington last year, locked down, you know, most of the guys that he went against just for the most part, put him in the box, put him in the box. The, um, <laughs> so here's my question. And I kind of be curious to get your thoughts in the chats thought here. Jabbar Muhammad at Oregon in 2024. Is he going to be better than as good or, you know, worse or not as good? as Christian Gonzalez 
in his one year at Oregon. I think that that's going to be an interesting point to kind of evaluate because I think that's the standard that the staff is ultimately trying to get back to, but they're also different players. Gonzo was longer, taller, faster, probably. Um, and I mean, that dude was a first round pick, but Jabbar Muhammad is a freaking dog. Like that guy can play, man. So where, where do we think he's going to ultimately stack up, especially when you consider the talent that he's going to be playing around at Oregon? It's a good point. I, I think it's hard to compare them based on the fact that, you know, Chris Gonzalez kind of came out of nowhere a little bit, right? He had a pretty good little run at Colorado and we were expecting him to be a good producer at Oregon, but he really made a jump and, 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 and people were like, Whoa, where does this guy come from? Right. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, when it comes to Muhammad, I think people know exactly who this guy is, right? This guy's already on the map, this guy. So can he do more than what he's already done? That, that, that might be a little bit harder to ask than Gonzo. Gonzo just completely jumped off the map in my mind. And, um, I do think that just body type wise, uh, uh, Christian had a way bigger leg up on the rest of the competition, just sure. on size and strength alone. That so when the when, when the NFL guys, scout guys, they just saw his measurables, they were like, "Oh, damn!" Put on the tape. Oh, wow. Okay, this matches up. All right, we got something here because they love those measurables. But um, yeah, when it comes to like you talked about that having that dog in him, now I'm telling you, Mohammed is a great player, and not only that, but his ability to play at a high level throughout the entire season. Uh, you know, injuries, everything else like that. You know, this is a guy who has already proven it at the highest level. Whereas it felt like with Gonzo, he really hadn't quite proven it quite as of yet, right? It wasn't quite at that level. So, no, I I tend to think that uh, that your, your next year you're going to have a big year because you're going to have to stop the run. There's not as many passing teams over there. It's it, the ball's not in the air as much in the Big Ten, just in general doesn't mean they don't throw it over there, but it means that you're going to have to stop the run. And these guys are going to have to come down hard on some of these run plays and try to, you know, uh, defend themselves from a line, a lineman trying to come down and, and, and get a piece of them on the second or third level. They're going to have to shake and bake their wide receivers who are going to be all up on them because these wide receivers over there can block like crazy. And it's just a, kind of a little bit of a different world. So I think the bigger, corner the faster corner uh the more uh engaged corner the more physically uh, uh, uh superior corner is going to be obviously better in a bigger stronger conference and i don't even know if we really know how much bigger and stronger this conference is week to week to week until we actually get there but i think it's going to be a pretty big deal i think i think that they're going to have way more run packages than, than pass packages over there and the pass packages i don't think are going to be as um exotic i don't think there's gonna be that many guys out on the flat i think there's gonna be a you know classic tech mobile style right where you got the one deep guy you got the one crosser and you got the underneath guy maybe maybe only two of those guys and you bring the rest of those guys in for the run package so um i think it will adapt though i think the big 10 will slowly start to uh open up a little bit on their offensive uh game a little bit but it's, it is crazy to me that you've seen this the sec explode with offense where just 10 years ago they were the offensively deficient league and now the big 10 feels like they're the more offensively deficient league and if you give a team like ohio state or michigan that can score the ball they can be your champion for sure for sure another um another comment here from our guy apollo 28 um i could be wrong but most teams winning championships are teams having players that know it's okay to wait learn and then play which is a really relevant point to make right now, since we're living in this transfer portal era, a lot of guys want that immediate grat gratification and they don't stay around. Um, and I'm not trying to um, criticize people that, you know, transfer or, you know, move, you got to find the place that's best for you. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of circumstances that are at play here that the average fan or even media member like myself doesn't necessarily know about. So, I think that the portal is, is good to give those guys flexibility, but at the same time, to a certain degree, to like to a similar degree here, the best teams in college football are ones that can manage the portal effectively and have a culture, a healthy culture at that that's in place, Ryan, where people have that belief they're bought in to the point of, hey, you may not play right away. You may not even play after your second year. But 
stay the course and buy in and just be a great teammate and someone that's working to be your best you. And when you do that and you get guys that are in the program multiple years, that this, this comment itself is a perfect example of why portal schools like Colorado right now, and then USC last year, haven't been able to achieve their ultimate goals. And I think that USC is going away from a portal school. Um, but obviously Oregon has uh, one of those healthier balances in the sport right now. I agree. And and I, I don't think you, I think it, it, USC is not one of those traditional portal schools. I feel like it just happened with their coaching change and whatever they tried to do. And they try to chase the ring a little bit with Caleb Williams. And I understand that, but yeah, to me, I mean, look, just just look at the situation with uh, Dante Moore. I mean, it's a perfect example, right? I mean, this is a guy who had everything going for him. He was the clear number one guy, uh, and uh, he here he is, and he has an opportunity to go to Oregon. And it felt like, from the outside looking in, again, I'm not, no no one's a judge here, but it looked like he decommitted because Bo Nix stayed an extra year. And it felt like there was a lot of extra going on. Probably UCLA also gave the bag. There's probably other sort of things happening. But the, the juxtaposition of the timing of it seemed as if, right? It seemed very similar to, oh, he's staying an extra year. All right, then I'm not going to play. I'm, I'm going to be out. Goes to UCLA, plays as a freshman, not that well, and understands, wait a minute, maybe I do need a little help. Maybe I do need some development. Maybe it's not going to be just automatic. And a lot of these guys, you know, Hindsight's 2020. Well, it's great when you be able to get to have some experience. So you're able to have that 2020. And a lot of these guys just don't have that experience yet. They're young guys. They're 18 years old. Maybe a couple of them switched high schools or whatever to try to look for a new experience, which is pretty common. But most of the time they were given the keys pretty early. They didn't have that much uh, in the way of, uh, of obstacles uh, for their success. And they get to college. And where everybody's promising them the world, obviously, as a senior in high school, you're going to be the man, you're going to be the man, you're going to be the man, you're the man. And then all of a sudden you get there and you're like, wait a minute, I'm not even close to the man. These, these guys are way better than me. How, how, how am the I going to do this? Don't mean anything. Right. It, it, the stars don't mean anything. This, that, and the other. I mean, it's, so it's, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a wake up call. So the fact that he had that sort of ability to say, you know what, maybe I do need to just relax a little bit. Just what Apollo said, sit back, wait a little bit, uh, learn a little bit. And then when I have the time to play, now I'm going to really take advantage of that. Instead of, here's your opportunity to play, but I'm not ready, I'm not ill-prepared, and it looks terrible, and now my draft stock goes down. Instead, I'm going to wait, I'm going to get the right shot at it, and then when I get the shot at it, I'm going to just absolutely excel. That should be the motto. I don't think in the NFL, to be able to be, to be, able to be a good quarterback in the NFL, you don't need to play four years in college. You don't need to be the starter every year on your team. You can bounce around. What you need is you need to have the measurables and you need to have some good film on tape. You need to have a little bit of positivity with the coaches that you worked with. If you have those three things, the NFL will definitely take a run at you. They'll at least go through all the different motions. They'll watch your pro day. They'll invite you to the combine or whatever the case may be if you're a successful quarterback in college. I mean, look at look at look at the guy like uh, uh, May, right? From uh, uh, UNC. UNC. <laughs> that guy looks the part, right? He coming out of high school, the guy's like, "Oh, damn, that guy looks like a pro right now," right? But he had to learn how to play the game. He had to get better. He had to learn how to not throw the ball into uh, opponents' hands. You think he's going to be an automatic in the NFL? No, he's going to have growing pains in the NFL. The best thing could happen to a guy like him go to a place where they already have a quarterback. You know, and they're talking about now he's he's slipping in the draft. Perfect. Perfect. Go to a place where you're not going to be the guy on number one day. Hell yes. Go to a place where you can be stashed a little bit. It's only going to be better for him because then when he gets his opportunity, now he's going to have something he can do with it instead of come out on his first opportunity and suck, which is what we've seen historically from these guys. Early picks, they go to bad teams. They put bad film on tape. They get locked in bad habits. And then they're, they're, they're tossed away because there's another guy who's going to be awesome. <laughs> You know, so I, I tend to think that your your uh, your wait and see approach is always the better approach, even though everybody's got such a, a, a demand to win now and do it now and be the man now. Dude, you have time. Wait on a little bit. I like Derek's comment here. There's something special about rooting for a starting quarterback your team recruited. Probably talking more <laughs> so about, you know, out of high school, right? Um, Justin Herbert more recently. Um is that the most recent? Because Bo Nix was a transfer. Yeah. And yeah, I, and it's, it's, 
I totally see the point here, but the reality is a lot of the top quarterbacks, uh, a lot of the top teams in the sport get guys out of the portal because they don't want to wait necessarily. Um, and, and I a think lot of guys, a lot of guys don't pan out, right, Max? You know, it's not it, <laughs> a lot of guys don't pan out. Great guys, great individuals just don't pan out. Yeah. I mean, is it is it fair to throw Ty Thompson into that discussion? Not even saying that he's not panning out, but like didn't pan out at Oregon. Like just the way he stacked up with the other quarterbacks in the room is probably a fair thing to say just because he he waited his turn, did his time um, to try to compete for a job and it just didn't materialize. And now he's out uh, to Tulane and wish him all the best. Sure. Look at a guy like Robbie Ashford. He's at another school this year. You tell me Robbie Ashford can't play quarterback. No, he could definitely play. Is, is, is he, is he as good as uh Spencer Rattler? <laughs> Time will tell. Maybe, maybe he goes in this year and has a great year because he has a new opportunity, new offensive line, new everything else. We've known that the quarterbacks at Auburn have a tough time a little bit. They run around a little bit. They don't have that much protection, you know? So maybe he finds a better space. That's great. He's the same guy, two different opportunities, two different teams, two different schemes. He's the same guy. That's the hardest thing to me about recruiting and in uh, the draft, right? Because it, the draft is basically recruiting for, for, for uh, pros, right? You can have the exact same player be in two different schemes and be completely different players. Completely. Yeah. And so who's, who? how do you know which is going to be the right guy? And how do you know what scheme is going to fit the right guy? That's where you got to have the mastermind. That's where you got to have guys who know their system really well, and they can pick guys to fit their system really well. You know, like that uh, Ozzie Newsome, right, for the the, the bank, uh, the uh, Baltimore Ravens for all those years, right? They had that steady thing. They had the same coach for all the years. They were going to all those championships. So they were, you know, it, they had a blueprint. They knew exactly what kind of scheme they were running. They knew what type of guys would fit their scheme. Look at Belichick. Look at all the success he had there. He would wheel these guys in and out and in and out and out, find the right guy. So it, a lot of it has to do with understanding your personnel and understanding your, your, your team and how your team is made up. And if you need guys to be able to fill a certain role, then, then and let, let them fill that role. You've seen this where one guy works on one team, they don't work on another team. That's mind-blowing for an NFL GM. I mean, you, you trade a guy who's terrible on your team and he goes to another team and he's amazing. Oh, great. I didn't see that coming. Otherwise, wouldn't have traded him. <laughs> Are you kidding Man. me? So. Well, we've, had, we've had some awesome combo here, Ryan. Um, we are at the hour and a half mark. So, um, you know, before we say adios here, just um, any, any other Oregon football thoughts or Oregon Ducks chat that uh, you want to put out there, man? <laughs> Yeah, dude. Anytime, man. Uh, catch me out on Tuesday nights, buddy. I'll be there live stream Tuesday nights, chatting it up. Uh, but yeah, no, there's a lot going on right now, right? Obviously, you've got uh, baseball. If you're a football fan only, then watch baseball just for Bryce Betcher. The guy's insane. Guy makes insane plays. Uh, he 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 had a play the other night where he was in a full sprint, dove and caught the ball, and then doubled off the guy at first. I'm like, bro. And this guy was your starting middle linebacker last year for most of the year. I mean, come on here, people. Are you kidding me? Uh, but, yeah, no, there's a bunch going on for Oregon, obviously. The spring practice is the number one thing. Basketball was a fun year this year. Basketball is looking really good right now. Everybody's in the transfer portal. No one's in the transfer portal for Oregon. Not one basketball player has left this team. Now, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Some of these guys might go. Who knows? But um, you had a decommit yesterday from the guard, but – Keyshawn's coming back. So that could be part of that story a little bit. Uh, but yeah, man, basketball was a fun year. It ended up really great. You know, it was too bad that those guys, uh, those two seniors went out that way. But you looked at that team, uh, Creighton play against Tennessee. I don't know if Oregon would have been able to play against those guys. You know, and if they beat those guys, you're playing against Purdue. Good freaking luck, you know. So you're, you're, your time's going to end at some point, right? But it's just a good time to be a duck, man. Uh, you're in our last spring of uh, Pac-12, and we're done there. Um, it, it sucks the, to, to, to break it up, but it is what it is. I'm really excited about going to the Big Ten next year. Uh, a lot of really great games coming up. So I'll still be doing stuff, doing videos, break down different things. But like I was talking about earlier before we even started the show, I'm always trying to be 
uh, cognizant of everybody's time, respectful, respectful of your time. I don't want to just spam the thing. I don't want to be on here just saying stuff, just to say stuff, to create videos for, you know, just to make videos. Uh, the, the, the uniform uh, thing came out the other night. I jumped on it. I made a video. Nobody could even hear me on the video. People still watched it. It was amazing. So I got a lot of love for the sports Jack community. A lot of love for you, Max, you know, this, uh, everybody else out there, all the other guys do great job out there. All the guys doing podcasts like QB 11 jumped in here. Uh, the flock pod, all the other podcasts that are out there. And then all the, the, the media guys, like, you know, our guy, Zach and Jared and all those other guys doing great work. Uh, Jared and Jared uh, and, uh, you know, Tyson Alger, all the guys doing great work out there. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big uh, believer in all that. And I'm a fan. So I'm not part of the media. I'm just a guy in my basement chatting about this stuff, watching. I'm reading what you're writing and I'm coming on here and I'm just BSing. Dude. I'm just that's how I do, man. I just whatever I is talking about. Let's talk about it. So can't thank you enough, Max. It's been a fun time. I love jumping on your channel. And again, you're the guy that started the live streams for me. So now I'm not trying to be the live stream king over here, but I am. I do. I do get a little. I do get a little thirsty on a live stream, and I have been known to have a live stream go uh, quite some time. Even in the last time I did a live stream for the freaking uh, uh, basketball game, I did a watch party. I've never done that before. People were asking me to do that, so I did that. So I was basically doing commentary during the game, uh, and I did. A, that was over four hours. I didn't even. I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't even. I didn't leave the microphone for one time. Ah. Man, so uh, if you're interested in what I got coming on, dude, I love it, man. Cheers, but uh, make sure you guys keep following Max. Keep following everybody else out there for the Ducks. This is going to be a great year. I think we can win it, man. I think we can go in that Big Ten and win that thing in year one. Ooh, they don't even know what they have coming, boy. I'm telling you. I don't I don't think they know what they have coming, man. I think the Ducks are rolling this next year. It's like uh, it's like what Lanning said himself um, as far as just the questions about, you know, what are you changing? As you're going to the Big Ten, you know, what do you what do you have to do to to be able to compete over there, more or less, right? And then it was something to the effect of, you know, I think they have to maybe change some things to to see what we got coming. Um, which was kind of a mic drop moment, but also like, you know, hey, I'm confident in what we have as a team and That's you know, the proof's kind of in the pudding, so to speak. So ducks they're are back gonna, at it. They're gonna have to adapt to us, I think, more than we're gonna have to adapt to them. And that's the whole idea, right? In football, you want to dictate the game, you want to dictate the terms. So that's the way I look at it. Oh, we got a we got a super here. Oculi to, Mortis, my guy Oculi. Just to, just to to end the uh stream. Just a dimer at the end there. Just a, just a 10 bucks right on. Right on. Ah, I love Oculi, um, man. Appreciate it. Thank um you your service, my guy. So yeah, ducks back at it, man. Tuesday, uh Tuesday morning in Eugene, I'm assuming. I haven't gotten the practice schedule yet, but I think that's yeah. probably safe to say. Um, so you guys, if you want to find more of Ryan, make sure you lock in with him at sports chat five Oh three on both Twitter and YouTube. Uh, if memory serves, if you guys want to find more of me, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, uh, at M Taurus sports. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Make sure to hit that like, and subscribe button at Oregon football, Max Taurus. And you can read me over on ducks digest, but until next time, thank you guys for taking some time out of your day. Talk some ball, talk some ducks with us. Thanks to Ryan for, coming on the this the the show and uh share the duck dish podcast with your friends with your family and with other duck fans and we'll see you in the next episode of the duck dish podcast